Okay, I think it's time to do another presentation. <laughs> Generally, I do these presentations in front of a live audience, <laughs> but because of the pandemic, darn COVID, uh, I'm doing them online. So enjoy, okay. Winter camping, oh, I love winter, I really do. I love all seasons, but uh, I just find winter amazing time to be in the wilderness. So some people are, whoa, you're crazy, man. I'm not doing that. So I'm going to try to convince you that it's not all that bad. In fact, it's really enjoyable. Okay. Tips and tricks. I think it was Thoreau that said wood warms you. Well, not twice. It's three times, isn't it, Tim? Uh, wood warms you three times? I know it's twice. Anyway, it's... I think that's what Ray Mir said. Oh, it was Thoreau before Ray Mears. No, oh, I think Ray Mears quoting, uh, quoting said three times. Yeah, so it's, it's, well, that's right, it's three times. What the first is to find it, second is to cut it, third is to put it in the stove Split for the it. fire. Right? Split it. Split it. Oh, that's right. No, yeah. So find it, cut it, split it. That's four or five times. It's keeping you warm all day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, it's a lot of work. And I do know when you think you have enough, I always get one more armful. Then you have enough. So some downfalls. There are some downfalls. Okay. Uh, it can get cold, really cold. Well, are they frozen? It looks like they're started. But they're bumpy on top. That's probably because the snow is falling on. I like my ice cube smooth on top. I find there's a difference with a dry cold than a wet cold though. I'd rather do like a, a minus 20 Celsius dry cold in the far north, minus 30 even, to actually a damp um, minus five with freezing rain. Uh, I, I just find that it's actually easier to keep warm that way, but, but it can get really cold, so just warn you, all right? There's a lot more work involved, okay, a lot, especially if you go solo. I generally, I don't, I don't go solo a lot winter camping because there's just way too much work. You got to cut the wood, you got to get the water, you got to put the tent up. Uh, yeah, and um, so, yeah, a lot more work. Uh, the weather conditions can vary, especially nowadays. Uh, I don't think I remember having a normal winter for the last few years. Man, all, all the stuff you got to bring for that too, because you never know if it's going to be rainy, cold, snowy, whatever. So uh, it always changes. And it could be out of your comfort zone. If you've never gone winter camping before, you're like, well, I don't know if I want to do that. And it's that phobia. And you don't want to go um, winter camping and be afraid of it, right? So, so it could be out of your comfort zone. You didn't tell me we were coming here. I brought me Speedo because I thought we were going to some tropical island. Bring your speedo, he says. Look where he freaking brings me. I would go on a lot of summer trips, fall trips, even spring trips before I would try a winter trip. And it could be uh, a lot worse out there. Oh, oh, someone's here. Oh. oh. <laughs> Come on. Go, 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 go. Come on. <laughs> you can't do it? I think it's impossible. <laughs> She's a smart dog. <laughs> You're not gonna pull it? You're not gonna pull the sled? It could be a bigger margin of error, meaning that if something went wrong when it's minus 20, things can go real wrong, okay? So you just have to watch that. You need a lot more skills, uh, uh, which actually I, I love the idea of winter camping. Like you really do need a skill set. And, nope, <laughs> here's your heat. Ooh, it's cold. There you go. That's how you get the poles part. And uh, you need a lot more gear. Oh, a lot of gear. Uh, and it's expensive too. I mean, um, um, a winter sleeping bag, 200 to 600 bucks. Like, it's crazy. 
uh, a hot tent, a thousand bucks, whatever. So I would beg, steal, and borrow before um, buying, um, especially if you're just going to give it a try. I, I got to say, <laughs> got a new sleeping bag uh, by Nemo, and it's, uh, it's called Coda, and it's what, minus, hey, well, it's minus 29 Celsius, which is minus, that's minus 20 Fahrenheit. And um, I was really warm last night in this thing. My whole face was really cold. I had to cover it up. But uh, I got to say, this thing worked a lot better than my other sleeping bag. Um, what was really good about it, it's got a little collar here um, around your neck. And that really, and I cinched it up, and that get, kept all the warm air inside, and that made a huge difference. Had a little hoodie like they all, they all of them do. Really fits your body well, though, I find. It's not like a mummy bag at all. I had lots of room, but really toasty. And the days are a lot shorter, which is really important to know. There's a lot more work to do. So I, I would set, set up camp just after three. I wouldn't wait until six. Um, you just, you're just going to be putting uh, everything up in the, in the dark. And um, it's really hard to find a partner. <laughs> really hard. Because uh, everybody thinks you're crazy. I'm going. I got a nice little cozy spot. I have no idea where it is. But it's got some good dead wood and uh, out of the wind. And I don't know. I'm just happy, happy to be here. And it is getting cold because my lips are getting difficult to move. There are bonuses. There's a lot more bonuses than maybe it's. What do you think? This is awesome. That's what it's all about. Big fluffy snowflakes. Not too cold. Out for a snowshoe. Life is good. He got a better hat than Mr. Baxter. I'm not fashionable, I'm functional. Well, you're something all right. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Absolute silence. I love it. The silence of winter. We don't hear that a lot in our normal day life. Uh, absolutely nothing. So out in the winter wilderness, you will hear nothing. Less crowds because nobody's going. So that's good. Uh, a lot more wildlife settings, even though there's less wildlife because a lot of uh, species even hibernate or go south or fly south, whatever. Uh, it, this more open area. And um, yeah, really easy to attract them as well. Uh, yeah, I just see a lot more wildlife in the wintertime than I do the summer. You connect with nature at a different season, and uh, you really do. And it's, it's really important to embrace winter. There's a lot of people that just try to get through it, you know. Um, and if you just sit at home and wait for winter to be over, you're not experiencing the real Canadian culture, like uh, the Canadian character. <laughs>
uh, it's out of the ordinary. Uh, it's, it's really cool because, you know, you, if you go out for countless summer camping trips, that's really out of the ordinary to go winter uh, camping. And that's, I think that's really neat to do in your life. You get to travel in unknown places because here's the thing. When you go camping uh, in a park, I know in Ontario, where I live, uh, you, you actually do not camp at a designated campsite. Uh, Algonquin Park, for example, you have free reign. They want you to camp somewhere else other than uh, the, um, uh, the designated campsite. Or even when you're um, hauling a freight toboggan, you can go through a marsh, uh, which is really good. I'll get into that. This is really, really good dry wood that could be found. Um, yeah, you would never do that in the summer, right? So you get to go to unknown areas. I really like that part of it. Where are we? You <laughs> said the campsite was just 10 minutes away. Well, we've been. That was two hours ago. Slog us a couple of hours. <laughs> oh. We were approaching our site. He literally did say that like an hour ago, didn't he? Yeah, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> nice country. He wouldn't be able to get here in the summer. Spring, we had a few bugs. Mm, yeah, just swampy. And... and it's nice. It's pretty out there. Hmm. Yeah, so tracking. Uh, and, uh, you know, in the summer, you wouldn't know what animal went to your campsite, but you will in the winter because you'll see its tracks. And Learning tracking takes a long time, but it's a, it's a really cool skill to know. You have to tell the story. It's not just looking at track and trying to identify it. it what's going on? And then that helps you figure it out. Start off with the gates. Is it a diagonal walker, like a deer or a moose, uh, like a baby crawling on, on the floor? Uh, left, right, left, right. Or is it a, a galloper or bounder, and that's a weasel or a lagomorph, like a rabbit? Um, is a, one of those. Or is actually a pacer, which is like a bear. Uh, or porcupine. They walk left, left, right, right, left, left, right, right. So we're looking at this and the pattern is a pace. But then we thought it was an otter or even a fisher, which would be, be the Mastildea family and that wouldn't make any sense, it would be a bounder. And then we're like looking at the impressions in the snow and I go, oh wait a minute, that's a, just a fat porcupine. And you can see the porcupine marks along the side of the snow. So we got a porcupine walking across the trail. Oh, I like this. I love the scent of winter. I love the scent of winter enough to suffer the cold for it. <laughs> so what's the best time to go? I would say late February, early March. Um, the reason why, there's a lot of reasons why, but, but usually in the early part of the winter, uh, it's not cold enough. <laughs> there's not enough snow. But also your body and mind are not used to it. Uh, it's, a, it's unfamiliar to you and you'll feel a lot colder. By the time February comes, uh, you're used to the winter time. And the days are a lot longer too. That makes a huge difference uh, when you're out there. And um, really good ice conditions. So not to say you have to, but if you have to go across the ice uh, to haul your freight toboggan or carry your backpack, whatever, then you know that the ice is gonna be good. Well, in theory, the ice would be better than in the beginning part of the season. All right, the great debate. Are you ready for this? Let me have some tea. Ah, oh, that's good tea. Cold camping versus hot tenting, okay? So cold camping, is what you see on the left there, is actually using a regular tent. A four season tent is better than a three season tent. A four season tent is, uh, it has um, so more solid poles, uh, aluminum poles, so uh, you, you don't have your tent collapse because of snow load. It also has better ventilation, a lot better ventilation, because when you're in the tent, your breath goes out, uh, frost um, forms, and it falls back on you, and you get wet, okay? So you want it to be well ventilated. You can use a three season, but just realize that it's actually ventilation that you really want, not being enclosed like a tomb, okay? So uh, yeah, the huge advantage of, of, of cold tenting is that it's lighter to carry. Then you, when you look at the, uh, the hot tent, you might get into the hot tent, you have to haul that on a freight toboggan and things like that. Whereas cold tenting, you can put it in your backpack and make more time uh, on the trail than you would with a hot tent. However, the biggest disadvantage is that um, 
well, it's, it's going to be a lot colder <laughs> than using the hot tent. So using a cold tent, it all depends on the, the weather conditions and the terrain you're traveling. So, you know, you, you get to choose. It also could be cheaper because these hot tents I'm going to get into are, are, can be quite expensive. This is hot tenting. And what hot tenting is, is basically using a canvas tent, uh, different designs. There's a snow trucker up top there and there's an Esker um, pyramid shape below. Uh, both are great tents. Uh, but uh, yeah, uh, the idea of hot tenting. So why I love hot tenting is that you have a warm place to get dry, okay? So a bunch of disadvantages. It, it weighs a lot, a uh, lot, lot more um, gear to buy. Um, you have to haul it on the toboggan. There's no way you're gonna haul this stuff all in your, your backpack. So you don't go as far uh, into the woods than, than if you have a, just a general backpack. You, you go a lot further with just the backpack and snowshoes. Just the idea of setting this up, getting the fire going, and you have a warm place. I'm talking really warm. Like when you get in one of these, you get the fire going, it's a song, okay? white Englishman. I am. I got man boobs. Kevin so, has a nipple story. Well, yeah, the suspenders and the they would rub against it when you're pulling the toboggan up the hill. That hurt. Mm. And I had to put Vaseline on my Well, isn't that what nipples. runners use? I would know. I'm not a runner. Huh. Interesting. He's, he's like oh, a, a sauna in, in here. here. Oh, the idea of like, oh, I'm going to be cold winter camp. Oh, my Lord. Uh, and then you get everything dry because that's really the, the downfall of winter camping. If things get wet and then they freeze, then things are going to go really bad. Ash, what are you, what are you hanging up? Oh, my speedo got wet, <laughs> so I just kind of dry it out over the fire. Yeah, I don't know how it got so wet. Maybe when I fell in the snow, maybe with it on, but hopefully it'll dry up there. I can't believe you still bring that thing. Yeah. And at night, too, you get to enjoy the evening. If you go cold tenting, uh, it gets dark at six, what are you gonna do? Like you can sit around the fire, but it's gonna be cold. So you're gonna go inside your sleeping bag, read a book if you want with a, a headlight on. But it just seems that the, the, the nights are so long when you're actually uh, uh, cold tenting. But hot tenting, you can go in there, get a fire going, get the light uh, on, and then have fun with your companions. Um, play cards, uh, drink whiskey, <laughs> and things like that. It's uh, more of a, communal uh, event, uh, taking a hot tent, and it would be just cold tenting. What's that sound? <laughs> Ooh. Oh, that's enough. Oh my God. <laughs> that's like a soup bowl. You need a lot of wood though, because that's what's keeping you warm. So uh, that is a disadvantage of hot tenting. You're gonna have to keep the fire going. Here's the thing. So uh, I generally do not bring an axe on a summer trip. Uh, I don't really think I need it. Uh, saw, yes, but not an axe. Uh, axes are very dangerous. And of all the times I've guided, especially youth, um, if someone has an axe wound, uh, they're being taken in. If they get a, a wound with a saw, um, yeah, they're fine. You can fix that. But winter camping, you need an axe. Uh, you can't go with that one. So because you're going to use a lot more wood, 
then you need to get to the dry in part of the wood as well. So that's why you wouldn't want to split it. All right, so Andy taught me this. Basically, you uh, put your lips to the wood, right? And you can feel the dampness. The nice thing about this wood we're cutting is oak. The fibers, I don't know if you can get close. Look at that. Fibers are really compact in oak and it'll burn for a long time. So it gets a good heat. Not the greatest to get a fire going, but once the fire's going, it's fantastic. So yeah, ax skills, really important to know your ax skills when you're heading out there. Yeah, like I said, like in general, in the summer, you don't really need an ax. I'm not saying you should not bring an ax in the summer. I generally don't, I just bring a saw. But in the winter, you need an ax. Well, we're gonna take down uh, this guy for firewood. So I've cut a notch here. I'm just gonna take that out with the ax and then do a back cut with the saw. Okay, but uh, that's my ax. No, this is actually mine. Is it? Okay. I got the same ax. It's a new ax. It's a new ax. Council tool, woodcraft. Yeah, that's um. Yeah, the, brand, more I, right? the more I use this one, the more I like it. Yeah? Yeah, I particularly like the handle. It's very... What is it, hickory? Hickory handle, yeah. The shaping is a little more lithe, narrower, which I actually like. And that Fawn's foot knob swell I'm a big fan of. It's just really comfortable. Very, very comfortable to hold. And that's a 24 inch? 24 inch, yeah, two pound head, flat ground. So uh, very easy to sharpen actually, keep a good edge on it. It's got like a different, it's good, looks like good for splitting. That's why I got it. Cause it's got the, what is it called? Beveled? Phantom bevels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. little that. indentations here. So it keeps an air space when you get into wood. It actually penetrates really well. It's actually uh, yeah, a very good, kind of an all around, uh, all around camp ax. No, like I say, the more you use it, the more I like this. Pole is hardened as well. So if you want to pound on the back of it, you're okay to do it with this one. If you had, uh, you know, metal implements, if you're doing just kind of a general workhorse, keeps a great edge, Can nice sharp. Can you put a sucker to it? I think you could. Yeah, so the all night versus the, the deep freeze. Like I, I, I said, um, do you go all night with the stove or not? And uh, it all depends. Oh, this is why I like going with you. You have a weak bladder, so I know you're <laughs> going to have to get up. Yeah, he knows that when I get up to pee, I throw some logs on the fire, and Kevin's like, ah. Oh. I love it, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you love me for me or just my bladder? <laughs> so sleeping in the cold. Uh, everybody asks me, well, what do you put on the floor? Well, there's a, a bunch of things you could use. Uh, first of all, the snow is an insulator. So don't think that the snow is a negative thing. Um, you, as soon as you get to camp though, you stomp it down with your snowshoes to compact it. And then you put the, the tent on the, uh, there. And if I'm in the middle of the wilderness, uh, I do boughs. So I cut balsam boughs. I wouldn't use spruce boughs, by the way. You use spruce boughs and you're there for a while. You will smell like cat pee. True story. Uh, balsam has a bitter aroma and also it's a weed tree. So trimming a, a, a balsam is actually helping the woods be quite nice. them in like a um, like a basket uh, on the floor uh, in, in the snow and that becomes your your floor oh look at that home sweet home home sweet home there's a room well look at all the wood we got oh. mm -hmm. that's a good thing about being in a bush camp there's so much wood we got some boughs or uh, if you're in a, a provincial park or a national park or you, there's no boughs whatever to get uh, you can put a tarp down. Now, I would not put one of those, well, you could, but you know those general tarps you get at you know, the hardware store? They're really slippery. I mean, you don't want something slippery in there because you might slip and then put your hand on the hot stove, and that's not good. Um, I get those, um, mat, those uh, tarps that are put over trucks on the highway. It it's kind of feels like a rubber, like a thin rubber, and they're better insulation, but also they're not slippery, right? And... 
Um, then you actually have to get uh, an air mat um, to sleep on or just more of those foam uh, um, mats or both. Uh, what I do is I go to the hardware store and um, get a six foot piece along of uh, that um, pipe insulation. And I take that, I put that down and then put my air mat down on top of that. It's more heat, but also air mats seem to get punctured when you put it down on valves and things like that. So uh, it's good to have those two layers. With those air mats, by the way, through the, the night, cause it's cold, uh, you blow it all up, it's, it's great. But then a couple hours later, it's going to deflate a little bit, but just to warn you. <laughs> <laughs> you alright? Yeah. You gonna pass soon? Soon. Kevin, <laughs> <laughs> leave me alone, or you can do this job. <laughs> okay, stop it. Are you done the other watch? But no, I'm not. Question. Your lips are blue. Are you, are you warm enough? Are you alright? Are they? Yeah, they are. No, they're not. No, seriously. Right. Yeah. I'm fine. Okay, you, you're not cold? No. Okay. Maybe I'm on the verge of, like, passing out. Okay. <laughs> Would you like to do this? <laughs> you can use uh, one of those uh, liners, um, SOL. I I've used those. Um, survive outdoors longer. Uh, SOL, survive outdoor longer, something like that. Uh, it's a bivy bag. One of those uh, bivy bags with re reflector tape. Not reflector tape, but reflector. It's an emergency, one of those emergency uh, bags. So it reflects the heat back to you. A pee bottle. <laughs> Sounds silly, but two in the morning, it's minus 20 outside. You know, want to go out and pee so label your bottle make sure you label your bottle and uh yeah use that to pee in males are easy uh obviously to, to use that uh um if you're female <laughs> you're like kevin are you, are you crazy there's a thing called a was easy um a whole bunch of different designs of those but it's a or a pee mate or whatever they're called have a look at those and that might help you out the dangers of of, of being in a hot tent because there's a fire so, oh, oh man, this drives me crazy because I used to take youth out hot tenting and now a whole bunch of school boards are like, oh no, it's too dangerous, it's too dangerous. They can't sleep in a heated structure. Why would you not want to sleep in a heated structure? I have no idea. There are some dangers. Could, could the tent burn? Um, yes, but uh, these hot tents, especially in Canada by law, there has to be fire retardant embedded in, in the canvas. Uh, okay, so with the, if that ever lit up, it wouldn't like... <laughs> it would start smoldering, okay, and burn slowly. But then there's the idea of poisonous gas, like carbon monoxide. And it's possible, uh, the idea of carbon monoxide, um, well, I could just see it, that you got the, the stove, uh, and then it goes down into just embers, and then the wind goes down the pipe at night, blows across those embers, and you're lying on the ground, low to the ground. You probably could get carbon monoxide from that, but those tents are aerated. First of all, the canvas is, is breathable, okay? Uh, there's ventilation holes up top. Um, I open the zipper uh, of the front door up a bit uh, throughout the night to keep that ventilation going. I have never heard anyone getting carbon monoxide poisoning through hot tenting. Let me know if you have, but I haven't. So if, if you're so concerned about that, just bring one of those um, battery rapid carbon monoxide Detectives. Problem solved. You always have gear outside the tent that you can use in case that thing burns down. And hopefully you're gonna get, get out of that thing. What I do is I sleep with this a knife around me. So if I really had to, I can cut through the canvas and get out really quickly. Um, and uh, let's hope that never happens. But if it does, if that thing burns down, there goes your heat source and you're stuck in the middle of nowhere and it's minus 20, minus 30. Well, what are you gonna do? And that's why you always have something outside uh, just in case. So first thing, big huge jacket. 
okay? Big puffy jacket, get yourself warm because you're gonna be in your sleeping bag, you're not gonna have all that stuff and that could be burning in there, right? Also, more warm stuff, like not a lot of wool. Um, I even got a mini uh, sleeping bag in there and I even have an escape bivy, SOL's escape bivy. So if I could use this with my down jacket and a bunch of wool and even my sort of small jacket or small sleeping bag in there, I can get through the night. But what if it's like it is now snowing? Well, I always bring emergency shelter. So this is one of those little shelters you can buy, just like a cane tire or whatever. It's the SOL, uh, what's it called? Um, shelter kit, <laughs> emergency shelter kit. And it's just a tarp, right, with some rope. And you can get that up between two trees, get a fire going, and you can get through the night. So look at it, really lightweight, but make sure this is stored outside the tent, not inside the tent. I put it in my uh, little bag in here and put it out by my toboggan. Uh, first aid kit. <laughs> That's really important because you could get injured while you're trying to get out of the, the tent. I also bring fire starters um, and I store them outside the tent because when <laughs> when it really happens and you really need to get a fire going, you're going to want help. So I get these fire starters. There's a whole bunch of them. This one, new ones I'm trying right now. Environmental log. And yeah, for sure, the spot. Don't leave this in the tent. Leave it outside the tent because if you really do need help, you're going to want to push this. Uh, I talked about this before, but basically, yeah, it's a, uh, a device that runs on satellite. You push it, and then if you really need help, uh, you can push 911 or SOS, and they come looking for you. I guess what the, my biggest point here is, don't store everything inside the tent. Because even though that's an amazing place to spend the winter night when it's minus 30 or whatever, if something ever happened that that thing burned down, and you had to get out, make sure there's something outside the tent that you can actually get warm and get another shelter going and get some help. How do you get around out there? Well. <laughs> That's the greatest thing about winter camping. You have snow. You can use snow to your advantage. Uh, when I went uh, to the far north up with the Cree and traveled with them, they travel a lot more in the wintertime than they do in the summer or the spring because of the bugs. Um, and in the wintertime, you can go a lot further, um, actually faster too, because um, you're using the snow to your advantage. Uh, so snowshoes is one way to get around it there. You're going to have to bring snowshoes. There's two types. Well, there's a whole bunch of different um, designs, but two general uh, types. The old traditional um, wood, and actually, usually it's what's called cat gut, whatever. Um, uh, hide uh, snowshoe, but actually the snowshoes I have here, that's a 20 pound fishing line uh, made by Lure of the North. Check them out by the way. Lure of the North has an amazing program. They take people out winter camping. Amazing. Oh, wait, wait. Okay, now you have to say that. What happened? You don't have a toothbrush? I entrusted its care to Kylan in the morning before we nah, left. Not true. And <laughs> she left it at home. So we're resorting to chewing on yellow birch twigs. It's Kylan Dave. But they also have other people around them. But literally, no, check them out. They're, they're great. Make good snowshoes too. Then you also have the new age um, uh, uh, ones that you just get at the outdoor store. Uh, aluminum and whatever they're made out of. They're very lightweight compared to the tr traditional ones. And um, easier to find to buy, to be quite honest too. But um, it, you, can, you, you can get around with them uh, in a normal winter where there's not a lot of snow. But if you're looking at traveling where there's deep snow, I wouldn't take them. I would use the tradition, especially the the, um, the tear shaped one, the Gotham style. Okay. Uh, later on in in the winter, I generally use what's called a bear paw. Um, they keep you up more uh, up uh, what we call corn snow. Uh, but yeah. Okay, sleds. So hot tenting, way too much gear. So you're not going to carry it on your back. Obviously, you got to haul it, and use sled for it. So there's different types of uh, sleds. You just make one out of, uh, of someone's sled. <laughs> uh, just go to the hardware store or whatever and buy a kid's sled and those plastic ones and use those. Uh, actually, I'm gonna go back to this because this is a really important point. I made this sled right here. Uh, it's one of those fishing sleds for ice fishermen and I you know, bought it for like 30 bucks. And then I uh, got PCV pipe and put rope through it and attach the rope with pins um, to the sled and also an old backpack uh, hip harness I had up in the attic. 
And really important point is cross those poles like that. If you have them like this, uh, they when you go around a corner, they will have, will have a tendency to flip over. But if they're like this, you go around the corner, it can't flip over. And why you should have poles instead of rope is because you know hauling up a hill is fine, but when you're hauling down, if you have rope, the, the sled is going to be hitting you from behind, right? So uh, by having those poles there, then um, it won't. I think we're home. You tried to attack me. <laughs> Bad sled. Bad. Okay, or you can get a freight toboggan. And this is a sort of like a plastic material. It's the same material that you have around the, the hockey arena. Yeah, so you can buy a freight toboggan uh, or you can make your own. And uh, this can handle a lot more gear. And it also is a lot easier to pull across the snow or ice uh, compared to those guys. Especially this one. Long ones or short ones? Uh, I, I have <laughs> I have huge, I, I think my, what my is eight feet, my buddy's is six feet. That's because I'm carrying the, the tent and the stove. Uh, so yeah. The one thing that's really important to know though is bring us a, a, a nice scraper or an old used credit card or whatever. But every morning before you start hauling again, scrape the bottom of that throw snow on it, if the snow sticks on it, then it's going to stick to the snow. So you gotta scrape that, that frost off that formed through the night, or it's like pulling um, a big load of cement, okay? Well, Andy and I hit a slush pocket back there by the swamp, and yeah, it's, it's good, pre-team blow, so this is what happens. <laughs> Look at this. So you gotta scrape that off. If you don't scrape that off, it's like, Pulling cement blocks. <laughs> it's just sticky like glue. Right, Andy? You bet. <laughs> I'm like, what? Is he, is Mr. Callan pulling on the back end rope again and jerking my chain or what? Oh. You can use storage boxes uh, to put all your gear in or bags. Uh, if they are, uh, if you are using bags like duffel bags or hockey bags, make sure everything is waterproof on the side. Andy is strapping his stuff down. What's going on man? <laughs> I'm trying out a new tank that Custom Sewing uh, asked me to try out. Uh, Dan Cook. Thanks a lot Dan Cook. I'm gonna try it out. I think because it's a tank and everybody thought they could just throw all their loosey-goosey stuff into my sled. So uh, we'll check on Tim here. Is that true Tim? You put more stuff on my sled because I have a new tank? And yours no, is bare. You've been known to, uh, when we end up hauling, my <laughs> toboggan feels like it's about 50 pounds, and I'm assuming yours is about the same, but when I actually try yours, it turns out it's considerably less weight. So, uh, just making sure that we're all spreading out the load evenly, Mr. Cowan. I don't know what he's talking about. So there's uh, one way I load up. Uh, I've got the stove uh, in there, but then I've got all my gear in, in these waterproof duffel bags, okay? And I'm making a tea on, with the Kelly kettle. So what, one thing we do traditionally, we, we haul through the day and then at, at noontime we stop and boil up the Kelly kettle for some tea. So see how it's boiling water around the perimeter. That's why it boils water so fast. It's not boiling water at the base, it's boiling water around it. See how it acts it convects like a chimney and the flames start popping up. And then all you do is either feed the sticks through there or you just drop them down through there. And I'm guessing less than two minutes we'll have some tea. All right, what to wear? Wool, 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 wool. I'm not talking about the big wool sweater that your Nana made you at Christmas. Um, I use merino wool, uh, which is not a brand, it's a type of wool. It's very thin and I, I layer up with, with that. Top layer I have on a Filson uh, wool coat. Uh, which is nice, it's a very tight weave. So even though there is a bit of wind today, I'm not, it's not penetrating the jacket. So that's nice as a top layer. Underneath that, I have a wool power. Wait a minute. Chicka chicka wah wah. Chicka chicka wah wah. 400 uh, full zip jacket as a mid layer. And then as my base layer, I have a wool power light, cause it's not that cold. Wool power light uh, crew neck on my top. And then on the bottoms, I have a pair of Filson wool pants. 
and I won't show you, but I do have a pair of uh, Woolpower light. Come on, show us. Show under us. There. Show us. Come on. She's going to do it. Show you a little yeah, bit. Yeah, she's going to do it. Ooh, there we go. Ooh. Okay, so wool power light long johns. But I think maybe what people don't realize about the wool pants, because for me, uh, the top, it's, it's nice to have wool, but for me in, in winter stuff, the wool pants are a necessity. So we've been out here taking pictures and stuff. So at some points I've been, you know, kneeling. The thing about wool pants, like even if you get in the snow, you get you know, snow all, if you're leaning, leaning down taking pictures, or if you're chopping wood, or you're getting down, you get snow all over your pants. Uh, first, like I don't feel that. I don't feel it. Like I don't feel wet on the inside, and then my body heat will dry this within a matter of you know 10-15 minutes. There'll be no snow on there anymore. I don't feel wet. It doesn't penetrate through, and it dries. I've never found anything as good as a solid pair of wool pants in the winter, especially if you have to be in the snow, like I say. And um, what I love about wool too is like you see on that photo that you're going to start sweating, even though they say you, know, you sweat, you die. And you know, there's, that's a good point because it'll create hypothermia and stuff like that, but you don't want to sweat, but you're going to have to, you're hauling toboggan, you're going to start sweating. The moisture is being absorbed by the wool and then it creates frost like that. And then you shake your wool sweater off and the frost leaves that um, material and you can put, put it back on, on again. That's why wool is amazing. Okay. It keeps you warm when you're wet. Canvas anorak, so the, uh, the it's a pullover you put, and it's made of the same similar material. Well, I think it's the same material as your tent. And you're like, geez, canvas, th that, wouldn't that uh, be cold? Well, what it's great about the canvas anorak is that it breathes, um, but it's a good wind protector. Okay, so if you're hauling across a, a frozen lake and it's like the wind chill is just crazy, you put that thing on over your wool, and it's fantastic. Uh, I would do that far before a really expensive Gore-Tex jacket. And I learned that years ago by traveling with people. I had the most expensive Gore-Tex jacket on. They had these anoraks that they actually made on their own, and they were far warmer than I was. Okay, uh, you don't have to, but um, you know, you put a, 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 a fur around the the, um, the hood, and that will keep the, the wind out as well. I uh, put a a patch of um, uh, social hair fur right here. And because you're breathing all the time, again, the frost is going to form there. So you just shake the fur off and then the frost is gone and dries up. You should wear or should pack a rain jacket because the conditions could actually go to the point where it's freezing rain and you're going to need that, all right? And headwear for sure. Make sure you wear a hat and balaclava to cover your nose and your face you know, because you get windburn or frostbite. <laughs> so there's the anorak, all right? I love those things. And you look good at it too. That's important. So you look at what we're wearing there. Far left, that's me with Anorak and I got wool underneath. Then Tim, he's um, all wooled up. And then there's Andy, or not Andy, that's Ashley, sorry. And that's him with the stuff you get at an outfit store, right? So he'll keep him warm, but I tell you, he was the coldest out on that trip. Footwear. Wow, man, that's like really important, <laughs> okay? Uh, you could get uh, rubber boots, the insulated rubber boots, like uh, up in the top there, what Andy is wearing. He, he loves those. Why they're really good too is that when you get into the tent, whether you're hot tenting or full tent tenting, whatever, you can take those liners out and dry them. And that's really important. Okay, so just wearing hiking boots isn't going to cut it because you, you're, you're going to get wet and you can't dry your boots. Okay, so those work. Um, basically, just get any boot that the, inst the, the liner can be removed and bring an extra liner as well so what the one the one's drying you can put the other in well top of the morning very nice morning nice and sunny no no, no snowstorm anymore change my boots here's my intent booties and uh i got a little tip here for you you always put an extra insole in to uh put um warmth underneath you especially if you're going to wear these guys so i put that on like so I put this on like so, and it's cold out this morning, so I shouldn't have any issue with these getting wet. But if it gets warm, I'm going to put my their Neos. Andy's got a pair. I don't know what brand those are, but they're basically the over boots, so they're waterproof. And yeah, you look like Herman Monster when you're walking with these. But and then when uh, people are tracking you, they think Bigfoot is in the area. But uh, other than that, it's nice and warm. 
or you can uh, use mucklucks or what some people call winter moccasins and absolutely warm oh beautiful like and you can feel the, the ground underneath your feet there's just phenomenal and especially for snowshoes they really fit well in the snowshoe bunny. they are slippery uh if you uh don't put anything any type of tread under, underneath if you've got snowshoes on all the time then you don't have to worry about it so but they are slippery new booties nothing like that booty the booty shaking that booty <laughs> <laughs> dan cook again custom sewing uh has mucklucks i didn't know he sells mucklucks but he does and uh <laughs> that's the wrong foot is it no okay. <laughs> water you don't want to drink snow it takes too much energy and fuel to melt the snow to make water uh it tastes bad to me it tastes like burnt milk and makes a terrible cup of tea so uh you're gonna to have to get the fresh water and i gotta tell you I, the, uh, the greatest story is when i was traveling with the Cree, we're out for a month actually it was only day five and um charlie the one of the elders he taught me a really valuable lesson um there was a snowshoe hair in front of me so i went to shoot it so we can have it for lunch and i missed so i started running after it and he goes kevin you're so bloody hyper just calm down he goes let's have a boil up and to do a boil up there like they don't drink the snow, right? So you had to use a chisel, like you see on the left there, to chisel away at the ice to get to the water, which takes a while. They said start by making your outline first and then working, uh, working that hole. So I'm, I'm starting with uh, the outline. It's in the hole. That is cool. You'll eventually get really good at with that chisel, but it, it takes a while. Uh, and then I, I got the water, I got the fire going, uh, I got the boil going, and I, you know we're talking like in, over an hour, right? And then um, he goes, "Okay, let's have lunch." I go, "What do you mean?" So what happened was the hares or rabbits, whatever, they'll um, they'll actually use the same run all the time because you know they're compacting the snow, so it's easier for them. So that that hair came back to where it started and I shot it and we had it for lunch. Or you could bring an ice auger, like to, down to the right. It's a little heavier and bulkier. <laughs> That's not fresh water. We hit the sewer line. Did you bring your filter? So yeah, uh, if you really had have to, you can uh, melt snow for water. Uh, right here at this campsite, it was all swamp around us, so it was bad water. So um, I, I melted the snow. But the trick there is put a little bit of water in the pot first before you start melting the snow, and it won't taste so bad. Meals, really important to eat really well out there because you're keeping warm by burning off your calories. Okay, so lots of carbs, lots of protein. Great grain, uh, quinoa for camping trips. Tim, it's two in the morning. Are we gonna eat or what? <laughs> Dude, it's like five to seven. I'm Give me hungry. a break. Ooh. I am going to make uh, a curry, a butter, butter curry with uh, uh, turkey and papa dumps. I'm making supper. I love making supper. Uh, ham, actually black forest ham with a sweet potato and some garlic, lots of garlic and some, what are they called? Blue cabbages? Brussels sprouts with Guinness draft. Good to have it the first night. Second night, that should be frozen. So we're not doing that, but uh, put that in there, liquefy it. I love this outback oven. It's called the Woody's. It's cast iron. No, it's not, sorry. It's not cast iron. It's cast aluminum, so it's lighter. Ooh, Andy. Look at that.
Nice, nice color to it. And you, I don't I don't put it all in. I've done it with a whole can. I just find it too dark of a stew. So I'm going, Andy, would you like to finish that off? Mm, <laughs> don't mind if I do. Ooh. That's a big roast right there. Nice. Yes. Just the roast is mm. with the most is. Yeah, it's very tough to live out here in the wilderness. You have to eat gruel. <laughs> so the thing about when you're camping for, for cooking stuff, you can make this at home and just freeze it and then put it in here and reheat it done that before and I just find that you have to have a lot of carbs you have to eat a lot of protein it's cold it's gonna get to minus 18 tonight and um, it's not cold in here though it's really hot in here but I just find that you need you need to eat well and I just find because we're in the hot tent looking at the stove and it's almost whiskey time that uh, we just get the Dutch oven on let it sit and cook for a couple hours while we're enjoying telling stories of your and um, Andy will tell us a few stories of his own. And uh, and yeah, uh, just have a wee dram and then we have dinner and then have another wee dram and go to bed. Oh. Doesn't that smell good? Also, remember what freezes. I remember a trip where I bought a, a salad. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it all went wilty or whatever it's called. It, it, yeah, bad idea. Um, bananas will freeze. Eggs will freeze. So remember, these things are going to freeze out there. So think outside the box when you're packing uh, for food. Okay, what could go wrong? Uh, lake and river ice, really dangerous. Okay, going through the ice. You do not want to go through this. It's, it, it, it's terrifying. Uh, it terrifies me. So know your uh, conditions. Talk to the locals if you've never been there before. Ask them where the, the bad spots are. Uh, they'll, they'll let you know. Usually where a lake will narrow before it opens up into another lake. Um, there's a generally a current under there. So if there's a current, the ice isn't going to be good. So it's usually where people go through. Swamps um, around beaver, uh, beaver lodges. Uh, it, it's warm around there. Uh, so you'll, you know, the ice isn't good. So you'll go through or at least get a whole bunch of slush. Like somebody's, somebody's hole. Yeah, a little frost hole in the top. Oh, we're gonna go in here. Yeah, yeah, that's. Uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna go that way. <laughs> what, what do we have? We have a beaver lodge with a frost hole from the steam and its warmth from their breathing and stuff. A little vent hole on the top there, which would indicate that there's beavers inside. Just a note: uh, if you're ever going to go through slush or ice it's usually around objects like a beaver lodge like a rock because heat forms around it and the ice is is not as thick and sure enough <laughs> right beside the lodge big slush hole lovely i did not want to fall through right now no me neither it's too cold thank good thank goodness we're on snowshoes though yeah it makes a difference if you're really paranoid especially you're going solo if i go solo i generally do not go across uh lakes and rivers i i, I stick to the bush but yeah know how to judge what good ice is. Hypothermia is a problem. It's more of a problem in the shoulder season, like spring and fall uh, than winter, but uh, it could happen. Frostbite, definitely, okay? So uh, keep everything um, covered up. And especially when you're going across a windy lake, just keep an eye on everybody else's skin. Like uh, I've actually got these two fingers frostbit when I was working in forestry back in the gosh, the 80s, um, and I still feel it uh, when the cold comes, okay? But yeah, if you see little white spots on people's faces, you gotta cover up, they're, they're starting to get frostbite. And there's a certain different levels of frostbite, like to mild to severe, right? Snow blindness, snow blindness, blind, snow blindness. Uh, yeah, so the idea of the, the sun reflecting and actually hitting uh, your eyes, uh, you, it's, you're basically getting a sunburn on your eyes. It's like getting um, sandpaper in rubbing up across your eyeballs it really hurts and if you get it then you're going to have to just sit in the tent with a cold compress on your, on your uh, eyes until it goes away which is going to be a while okay so wear sunglasses okay. severe weather obviously uh so know the conditions know uh when to stop and get shelter okay and getting lost uh i mean in theory you could say kevin i just have to follow my footprints in the snow back yeah well what if there's a snowstorm okay so know how to navigate with a map and compass and GPS. 
Oh, by the way, I always bring a map and compass in the winter. GPSs are great, but if those batteries freeze, good luck. So how to keep clean out there? Uh, okay, uh, you could do this. That, that's Kai from the show alone, from Lurla North. And um, yeah, uh, I'm not, that wasn't for me. Uh, those wipes, bring those uh, wipes. I remember when I worked in the bush and I lived in a prospector tent, I brought one, one of those blow up, um, uh, blow up uh, pools, uh, kiddie pools. And <laughs> that's how I clean myself at night, put some hot water in there and had a bath. But yeah, those, those wipes are good. And um, you can use those to keep clean. I'm going to do a tutorial of how to poop during a snowstorm. <laughs> Look at this scenery. Look at this. Nice. Uh, step number one, go way back away from the campsite. Step two, get out of the wind. Because <laughs> eventually your buttock is, or buttocks are going to be exposed. And we got a wind chill happening, so. <laughs> Step three, make a hole in the snow. <clears throat> Drop your drawers and hope it happens quickly. I know some people that go winter camping use snow for toilet paper. <laughs> that ain't happening with me, sorry. <laughs> but what I do is I, I burn it after I'm done. And uh, so in the springtime, Nobody sees a bunch of wad of toilet paper on the ground. And the other stuff will just bio biodegrade in a couple of weeks. It's good. One way to get your hands warm too. <laughs> and make sure you clean up after your business. You love it. Absolutely love winter camping. Hello winter. My heart is warm and ready to enjoy your cool loving touch of beauty and splendor. I should mention I have a book called The Clean Guide to Winter Camping by Kevin Cowan. Uh, it's available everywhere. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, all these tips and tricks are in there as well. So check that out. There's a whole bunch of other winter books as well. And I'll put those uh, below. Uh, link, uh, list of those below. And yeah, get out winter camping. Uh, whether you're a hot tent, cold tent, whatever, or even just go out for the day. Just get out there and enjoy it because it's going to be a long winter uh, if you don't. Give it a try if you haven't, uh, whether you're cold tent, whether you're hammock, whether you're hot tent, just get out in the winter and uh, enjoy that season that we have in Canada that a lot of other people don't, because it's awesome. <laughs>